Tonight, we'll break down how climate change threatens a generations-old fishing industry in India. But first... Philip Kim is Canada's breakdancing powerhouse. Right in front of the art gallery over here was where I started breaking. Pan Am Gold now breaking into Paris for the sport's Olympic debut. But he is in a fight between doubt. A lot of people saying you should have a backup plan, this isn't for you. And dedication, a rising champion in a rising sport. So to the naysayers, I say just wait and see. I met Philip Kim, also known as Phil Wizard, in Vancouver, an unusual athlete on an uncharted path to the Olympics. You just won the gold at the Pan Am Games. Yes, Congratulations. Thank you very much. And by being in the final, you qualified for the Olympics. Yeah. So that was a big moment. What was it like being in that final? Um, honestly, I was very relieved. So moving into the final battle, I had already qualified and like in the back, I was already like, thank God, like it was such a relief for me. But at the same time, in my head, I was kind of extra motivated to win because I was like, if I lose in the finals, but then I qualify, it's kind of bittersweet. Amazing, amazing. Say what? So after the second round, going to the third round, I already felt like I took the first two. So for me, it was almost like, I felt like it was like a victory lap, but at the same time, you never know. You never know, you don't get to see the judges score until the end. So in the end, I was like, I'm pretty sure I took it, but I'm not 100% sure. And then I think when the scoreboard showed, it was almost all for me. Um, and at that point, I was like, yes, okay, I was very relieved. But that's the thing, it's one of those sports that is judged, and so, I know in other sports that can be a really frustrating thing for, for the athletes. How is it for you to be in a sport where judges are, you know, ultimately determine whether you've won or lost? Yeah, it's, um, it's honestly a big kind of, I don't wanna say controversial, but it's a topic, especially within breaking because breaking is so subjective. Like it's not like other traditional sports where the fastest or the strongest person wins. There's so many different criteria. There's a lot of subjectivity to it. So your hands are kind of in the judges, but you sign up for that when you enter the competition. Um, honestly, my goal is always just to show up, dance the way I want to dance and represent myself the best. Um, as long as I do that, as long as I have fun, I'm always kind of okay with whatever happens. Uh, hang on a second. There's some really complicated uh, psychological stuff going <laughs> on there. Like, so you're in a final. Judges are going to decide whether you win or lose. Yes. And are you truly as zen-like about let you know I'm just gonna do the best I can let them make their decision I'm fine with it yeah very much I think like I, I really tune in because I don't really think about the judges when I'm competing I really try to tune in on just me the opponent and more than anything myself I know like at, at the stage that I am in breaking in my career like I can beat anyone but I also know the, the times I've lost is I lose to myself and for me what works is just to stay positive and kind of enjoy the moment because when I'm not enjoying it that's when I stress and that's when I kind of mess up up and do worse so I really try to just have fun in the moment especially going into the Olympics I want people to see like the positive side of it that we're having fun up there even with how competitive it is because it, it is kind of like you're doing a bit of improv up there well like yes. it's not a, a set routine that you're trying to hit you're you're in the moment kind of figuring out while you while you do that yeah 100% a lot of people approach it differently but no matter what there's a amount of improv in it because um, we don't know what music's being played so the DJ is playing the music and you have to kind of adjust to it I have a lot of moves I have a lot of signature moves that you'll see me do throughout many competitions but when I do those moves just kind of happen in the moment and so I think that's kind of what sets me apart from the competition so give me an example of a classic uh, okay. Phil Wizard movie. Yeah, I, the names are so funny because in breaking, like you have your foundation, but then a lot of it is like making up your own uh, moves. So I think in the final battle, let's say at the Pan Am Games, I have one that I call like the zombie walk that like I go up to the opponent and then I kind of do like a swishing movement going backwards. Mm -hmm. I have one that I call swimming um, or Philip Phelps because it's like named after <laughs> Michael Phelps because it's like a front breaststroke, but on the floor. Um, so moves like that. And like I said, uh, like the swimming move, you're inspired by a lot of things like that move was made from watching swimmers um, the zombie walk was just made when I was dancing and I kind of made that move and then named it after uh, but we draw inspiration from a lot of things So I, I can tell that you, you love what you do. What is it about breaking that you love so much? Honestly, like I grew up playing a lot of video games. So for me, breaking is like the ultimate video game. Like I'm always finding something new. I'm meeting new people. I get to travel around the world. And then the act of dancing and breaking itself is what kind of 
continues to push me forward. I just love doing it. I love the artistic difficulty. I want to find something new. I want to keep creating. Um, it's the ultimate video game. I just keep putting like time into it. The more time you put into it, you level up. You can put into like uh, in a video game like different skill trees. I can put. I can work on this skill. Or I can work on this skill. And the more you work on one, the less time you have to put into the other. So you have to figure out what, exactly what you want to work on. So yeah, I feel like it's just everything I loved as a kid put into one kind of craft. <laughs> So here we are, Robson Square in the yes. heart of Vancouver, and you literally had a moment here that changed everything. Yeah, so right in front of the art gallery over here was where I started breaking. Uh, there was the local crew now or never, they were performing right there. I was standing right here, saw them for the first time. And then actually right below is Robson Square, which for a very long time was kind of like my second home. It's the hub of the street dance community, or at least it was for a very long time. So I remember going there most nights, training, practicing like late into the night, even when I was in school. And so when you told your parents about this passion you had for breaking, what was their reaction? Um, initially, they were okay with it. I think when I wanted to do it as a career, it changed a little bit because just out of worry, out of love, they wanted me to pursue something that was a little bit more stable. Uh, but in the beginning, they were super supportive. They loved and could see, I think, the passion from an early age. So let's talk a little bit more about pursuing it as your job, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not surprised that your parents would worry for you. Like, of course. doesn't really seem like the kind of, that there would be a career in that. Yeah, I think I got lucky, especially now, like looking back, but at the time it was very difficult. Uh, my parents were always extremely supportive. It was just, um, again, it was out of love that they were worried for me. Um, and also my parents immigrated here from Korea. You know, they gave up their lives yeah. to give us a different opportunity. Uh, my brothers went to school and then I'm the one that kind of goes and wants to be a break dancer. So I think for the first few years, especially, it was very difficult for them but I think just society as a whole that like breaking isn't something that's a viable career and so with breaking going to the Olympics a goal for me really is to change that narrative as well. You should have been a doctor or a lawyer. Yes exactly. <laughs> So Boogaloo Academy, tell me about the importance of this place to you. Yeah, this place is a special place in my heart. It's part of like the A-Star Society. So they're like a nonprofit that have opened this studio. Um, they were kind of integral to my journey. The two owners, Jarek and Anita. Jarek was the first person that actually introduced me to breaking. So this is kind of my second home now. It's my haven that I get to come by myself or with a few buddies, come and train and just kind of work on my craft and get ready for the next event. You seem so comfortable in this interview. You see, you obviously are so successful at what you do and yet I, I, I know you talk a lot about battling self-doubt. Mm -hmm. um, tell, tell me about that. I wasn't a very confident kid, kid growing up. I was very insecure um, and I don't know where that comes from. Probably a lot of different things um, and I think especially in the world of breaking like there was a lot of doubt for me if I could make it because such a small percentage of people make it in competitive breaking like literally the top one percent. There was at the time when I was trying to do it like a handful of people who could make a living off of this, who could kind of live the, the life that I uh, get to live now. Um, and so there was a lot of internal doubt of whether I could do this and external as well, because it's something that not a lot of people traditionally think you could make a career out of. So yeah, a lot doctor, of people, lawyer, breaker, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so a lot of people saying you should have a backup plan. This isn't for you. And I didn't think I was particularly talented in this. I think I was just consistent over time. Um, but it's something that I try to fight through and, and try to push through and something I'm continuously working on. Okay, so, so I think you have a lesson here for a lot of people, whether they're athletes or artists who are troubled by that level of self-doubt. So, so how, do you, how have you overcome that? Um, I'm, I honestly, I'm learning to deal with it still today. I think the first thing is I really, as cheesy as it sounds, I try to focus on the positive. So I try to remind myself like why I do this. First and foremost, it was never for all of this. It was never for the, the attention. It was never for the success. It was never for money or anything like that. I did it because I loved breaking. And so whenever I feel like there's difficulty uh, mentally or anything, if I'm anxious about the next competition, if I'm anxious of the fact that the Olympics are coming up and I don't feel ready, like it's just kind of going back into the craft. So I'll come to the studio, I'll put my phone away and I'll just dance. And that is often like the adrenaline brush that I need to remind myself um, why I do this. I had that yesterday. Um, I've been traveling a lot and yesterday was my first practice back. And it was again a reminder of like, okay, uh, I'm very grateful for everything that's happening, but at the root of it all, it's just because I love to dance. And so I try to come back to that always. 
That's a great message. Uh, you are going to be an Olympian. And so there's some grumpy people who would sort of sit back and go, breaking? Yeah. That's yeah. not an Olympic sport. Yeah. Shouldn't be. What do you say to them? Um, I say, honestly, just wait and see. Um, every Olympic related event that I've been to that has had breaking, I've had a lot of people come up to me after the event being like, I've never seen breaking before, but this has blown my mind. I think when people see it in Paris, they will fall in love with it. I don't have doubts about that. Um, so to the naysayers, I say, just wait and see, like give it a chance. You are at the top of your game, like you know, and, and you're very celebrated, quite justifiably, for what you do. Um, if you had a chance to talk to the 13-year-old Phil, 14-year-old, what you were like back then, what would your message be? This is a hard one because I know what my message will be, but I know the kid won't believe it. <laughs> um, honestly, I would just say, like, believe in yourself, as cheesy as that is, because I and still today uh, have a lot of self-doubt, but I, it was extreme when I was young, and I questioned every day if I was, if I should do this, if I should break, if I should just go back to school, get a job, like go through the more traditional route, and I would tell him, just believe in yourself because you're gonna do it anyways. And it's working out. And it's working out pretty, pretty decently right now. <laughs> All right, really nice talking to you. Good luck in you Paris. Well. Thank you very much. As open and as humble as he is, don't lose sight of the fact that he is one of the favorites to win a medal at the Paris Olympics. Our changing climate is changing the lives of some in Mumbai. The toll being paid by a generation. Next. India's biggest city, the fish are disappearing, the storms are surging. 52% increase in the number of cyclones, 52% is remarkable. And in Mumbai itself, squeezing those who fish out, urban growth and a warming sea challenging a way of life in real time. Salima Shibji takes us to India's coast where the impacts of climate change can be seen when those fishing boats come in. Early morning, and the rickety fishing boats are already pulling up along India's west coast. One by one, after a short spell at sea. As those on shore wait anxiously to see what's in today's catch, which lately have been lean. Their lives depend on it. The baskets seem plentiful, bags full of fish that Mumbai's traditional Kohli community of fishermen need to make a living. But as the families who've been fishing these waters for generations get down to work, sorting and evaluating the haul, the verdict isn't so great, thinks Prima Baliram Kohli. Only 14 crates, when a good day brings 50. Sometimes we get next to nothing. Fishing here has changed so much as the sea has changed, she says, and our expenses are very high. Their boats have to venture into deeper waters far from shore, and the nets don't drag in what they used to. Fish disappearing and ecosystems disrupted, experts say, because of drastically warming temperatures. The Arabian Sea is part of the Indian Ocean, which climate scientists confirm is warming faster than any other. That means more powerful cyclones are much more frequent. And Arabian Sea was very calm and quiet in the past. No longer, this scientist says. She studied severe weather patterns in the Arabian Sea over the last 40 years and found a major difference in the last two decades. It's about 52% increase in the number of cyclones compared to past 20 and recent 20 years. So 52% is remarkable. The cyclones now last 80% longer and intense storms have tripled. Dinesh Kohli, a fisher his whole life, knows how his sea is changing all too well. This boat replaced his previous one destroyed in Cyclone Tokte two years ago, which took more than 170 lives and caused millions of dollars in damage. A memory is still so painful for his wife. Even as Rajeshwari tries to go on as she used to, she's haunted whenever another cyclone passes through. There was nothing left of our boat. We lost everything, she says. I couldn't bear to see it. She prays a devastating storm like that won't hit again. But climate experts say it will. 
it's the new normal. All of these boats destroyed in previous cyclones serve as a painful reminder, not just of the loss, but also of an uncertain future. And it's not just warming temperatures that are threatening the livelihoods of the fishermen here. There's also large scale construction projects. Mumbai's billion dollar coastal road that's meant to ease the city's crippling traffic has squeezed local fishing villages and warped fish habitats, the fishermen say. The government's priority is cars and parking. Why is there no space made for us or our boats, Fisher Sanjay Biker says. With their land shrinking, the strain of selling their fish at market has intensified. Many have given up, leaving their traditional jobs passed down the family line behind to find more profitable work. Their boats now often stay anchored for days, with erratic weather patterns hard to predict. My old boat drowned in a cyclone, Kashinath Budhya Kohli says, so I need to be careful with my new one. Government relief barely covered 10 percent of a total loss. The specter of more losses hangs heavy for a community pushed to the brink and so dependent on rapidly warming waters. And let's bring in Susan Ormiston, who's at the climate conference in Dubai. Uh, Susan, there are climate trends and climate policies being discussed there that will affect those uh, fishermen. Indeed. And, you know, that ocean heat that Salima talked about, we saw that as an early sign this spring of this warmest year that we're experiencing. What we're talking about here is a concept called adaptation. So essentially those fishermen, how do we support people like that living in communities who are experiencing long-term climate change? It's not going back. And we're not just talking about heat or drought. We're talking about rising sea levels, a big issue, and also getting enough food. It may be a theme at COP28, but that doesn't always translate into policy. Well, they're trying their best here. I can tell you that we're hearing a lot about this idea of adaptation. Why? Because negotiators are a bit frustrated that this funding for communities, often in developing countries, to adapt to long-term climate change, the financing is nowhere near where it needs to be, according to negotiators. So Sunday, they even brought in ministers, so the top level of the delegations, to give the idea some ambition because adaptation is perhaps being overshadowed, they say, by all this talk about the oil and gas industry and the role of fossil fuels and whether that will be in the final agreement. And in here at COP, in this process, it's a consensus that has to be arrived at at the end. And if one piece is missing, like adaptation and what to do about those fishermen, then that could derail the entire final document. Thanks, Susan. Susan Ormiston at the Climate Conference in Dubai. Next, a BC man wins his dream home while taking a break from his phone. After leaving a message, you can hang up. <laughs> the team effort to track him down in our moment. This seven-bedroom house was the grand prize in a BC charity draw. Earlier this month, they picked a winner, then came a surprise. The new homeowner didn't come forward, and that prompted friends and family to scramble to get him on the phone. And tonight, that short bit of chaos is our moment. Juan Pablo Silva Perez, you are the new owner of a beautiful home on Monroe Drive. Congratulations. When I bought the ticket, uh, I've just kind of always thought about especially because it's a hospice ticket, you know, always trying to help out a little bit. She was like, JP, are you going to buy one? And I was like, yeah, I'll buy one this year. You never buy it expecting to win it. I just met up with my friends and we were being pretty nerdy and playing a board game. And I put my phone face down. After leaving a message, you can hang up. <laughs> <laughs> I must have had, I don't know, like 60 missed calls. My dad was like, what's going on? Is it true? And I was like, is what through? And he's like, did you win? And I was like, did I win what? And he was like, a house. Everybody's saying you want a house. This is beautiful, you know? <laughs> and then I kind of just flashed back to buying the ticket. <laughs> and then when I saw the video, I was like, yeah, that's me. I called her and she was like, hey, JP, you won. I don't know, you can, I can make a couple tacos on here. And she's like, hello, hello, JP, are you there? And all I could say was, I'm happy. Uh, and I, I broke down and it was, it was amazing. 
So honestly, I'm not a big fan of like the usual lotteries, but this one's different. It's to raise money for a hospice. He didn't want to win. He didn't expect to win, but he certainly was a gracious winner. And what a beautiful home. Thank you for being with us. You can watch The National anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. I'm Ian Hanna-Mansing in Vancouver. Good night.